Okay, I'll just start telling this part to start sitting. All right, if folks want to start finding your your seats, is this on? Yeah, if, if uh, folks could start start finding your seats, um, bring a drink or a plate of cookies or whatever with you. All right, we're going to hear our final report from from our rapporteur for the week, but I wanted to take a few minutes to thank the very, very many people who made all of this possible, not just the week, um, which logistically, it just amazes me that this all came together, that I got to where I was supposed to go, and that all of you got to where you were supposed to go, and that the PowerPoints went on and all of that. There was food at the right time. That's amazing. <clears throat> but we would have had nothing to talk about for the week if it hadn't been for a huge team that was led by Glenn Anderson, who doesn't seem to be in here, <laughs> but you've all seen Glenn. Um, so Glenn, in your absence, thank you. Um, my, or our team at USAID was uh, me, Jonathan Cook, who has taken over leading this giant <laughs> amoeba of a project, octopus, whatever it is, um, while I'm at state. Jenny Frankel-Reed is back there. We saw her earlier. Um, Andre Mershon is right over there. And then uh, we lost Nora. Well, that sounds terrible. We didn't lose Nora. Um, <laughs> Nora left USAID and went back to Seattle. And she's now working for Cascadia. Um, and we saw some of their work yesterday from Andrea. Um, Ken Baum, we also lost Ken. Again, not in the dramatic way. Actually, we've physically lost him now. I don't see him. But Ken acted as the, um, the contract officer's representative, the guy who made sure that IRG got paid every month and watched over all that stuff and left me and Jonathan and Jenny and Andre free to, uh, to do the more fun stuff. Fun in, in my view, anyway. Um, <clears throat> on the implementer side, um, all the publications that are out there that you've seen, we have Michael Cody and Jamie Carson to thank. There's Glenn. Um, and Joanna Pratt with Stratus and other people who aren't here this week. Um, the, the work both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes was done by Joanne Potter, Charlotte Mack, um, Angela Wong, Randy Freed, who was a, sort of a senior advisor and, and mentor and sensibility checker at times. Um, John Snyder over here. Um, oh, Deborah Tepley Ferguson, or Deborah, Deborah Tepley. We finally wore her down. Um, 
Glenn has been the, the chief of party and Peter has been the deputy. <clears throat> I don't think we could figure out the right words to describe Deborah's role, sort of the intellectual leadership or misleadership, whatever came from many cooks, but Deborah made everything actually work. And without her, I think this thing would have spun out of control about three years ago. Um, <clears throat> Glenn was our chief of party. Peter Schultz, whom you heard from two days ago, was the deputy. Um, in addition to doing all this work, uh, oh, there's the IRI team. Steve, Kathy, Lisa, and Haresh, and Walter, of course. Um, Skyler, thank you. Um, a lot of the junior people that you've seen running around making sure that this works have been running around for three or four years and making sure all of the work that we've seen worked. And it wouldn't have come together um, without Charlotte in Macedonia and Mukul in uh, Ethiopia and others elsewhere. I didn't mention Mukul. I don't see Mukul. Oh, there he is, Mukul. Um, so thanks to everyone. This was truly a team effort, and it's been a great team. Um, very good folks to work with and also a good group of friends to hang out with. I will stop. If you don't have any publications, <clears throat> there are plenty out there, and I think that the team I just described would be thrilled if you would take them so they don't have to put them back in the box <laughs> and take them somewhere else. All these things have been all over town this week because we've moved them from site to site. They're <laughs> very well traveled. Um, I shouldn't tell you this, but they are also all on that little thumb drive, um, but it's not the same reading on a computer as reading paper. So. Um, with that, I will stop or, and then restart to introduce Lawrence Bouja from NCAR. Lawrence did not contribute to the book on valuing climate services, but I'm sure it would have been great if he had. Um, Lawrence has been a part of the Climate Services Partnership from the beginning. He's uh, been in and out of our work, sort of an informal uh, external advisor and friend to the project. And he has been in every session this week. Um, taking notes, and he's going uh, as our rapporteur for the whole symposium, and he's going to provide us with some closing thoughts. If I stop talking, we'll have enough time at the end for um, audience, uh, sort of an audience rapporteur summary, audience participation thing. We'll see how that works. Lawrence? So, so, so thanks, John. Um, yeah, I've done this before at the International Climate uh, Conference for Climate Services, and uh, it's always a, a rush to go through the whole week. And I'll be focusing on the lessons learned, the outcomes. I may talk about some of the process of the talks as we go along. But one of the things, um, there's been a lot said. And so feel free to jot something down if, if a particular lesson learned stands out for you that you want to talk about later. And the other thing is that if I get your name wrong, it just means that I need to meet you and get to know you better. Um, please don't uh, take offense. So, okay, so we start off on, on Monday morning with this opening plenary on advancing climate resilience development. Rolf Anderson talked about uh, the growing adaptation community around the country that's trying to decode what climate adaptation really means and how this framework is helping to respond to the Obama's directive to integrate climate into the USAID programs. And then he put a pitch, I don't think anyone's heard this yet, for climatelinks.org, okay, uh, USAID's new uh, climate knowledge portal. Then Glenn Anderson really kicked us into speed with the overview of the whole project. Why did it exist? What does it support? What are the, the various objectives? And then uh, tag team with Peter Schultz that's talked how it supported the national adaptation plans, um, the CRISP program, and how can it be mainstreamed inside and outside of USAID. And then with the questions there of how could it best support mission staff trying to climate proof their projects? And Rolf pitched in that they really saw this as a new approach of start with the design process, look at country strategy level, what are the priority sectors, what are the specific climate investments needed for that sector, and then look at the impact on, in, on upcoming projects. What is the cost? How can you make better choices uh, through smart design with low incremental costs? And then uh, John jumped in, uh, John Furlow, and says missions don't want another guidebook. They've got piles of these. They want visits, they want trainings on how to actually do things. 
And then John presented on the, uh, the history of the framework, starting with the 2007, 2008 uh, meetings and action plans, the 2012 Jamaican meeting. Um, and the outcome of that was the recognition you can't look at uh, climate adaptation in isolation. There's always going to be other stressors. There's always going to be other crises that undermine development. And you need to integrate your solutions. Siloed climate adaptation planning often um, sets up different approaches and different solutions in the same area, trying to do the same thing on top of each other. You really need to coordinate. Um, and one of the questions that came out of that session was now that the framework's been applied in several countries, what needs to be changed? This was a nice question. Um, and John responded, you need to understand the country uh, decision-making and policy processes, where you are at. You need to mold yourself to fit the country, not the other way around, and be prepared to work with legacy structure and processes. Uh, he also noted that there were a lot of different funders in the area, GIZ, DFID, uh, the various banks, um, and that these provide tools for the country to organize and own the whole process and coordinate the international actors. Uh, we had an unforgettable lunch keynote. Thank you, Pablo's, uh, Pablo Suarez from the Red Cross Red Crescent. Uh, a lot of highly interactive uh, action at lunch. And then we went into lessons learned in the afternoon session, uh, lessons learned from the framework. Uh, start off with some uh, discussion of the annexes by Jason Vogel. He talked about the spe uh, sector-specific annexes for water and coastal zone, and then the deeper dive substantive annexes uh, that looked at resilience, uh, vulnerability assessments, conflict, working with marginal populations, um, and then a number of lessons learned out of there that, uh, that the framework can only be useful if it's implemented. You need to get it to that, that spot. And Jenny noted that these were already being found very useful within the office. Uh, Mary Ackley from USAID talked about climate change and conflict, and this is a new area to me, so it was pretty interesting to hear on this intersection of conflict and, and climate change and their key findings that most of the fragile countries are most vulnerable to climate impacts, but most of the climate vulnerability countries are not fragile. Um, and that the overlap between climate change and conflict shows the importance of addressing this through a resilience lens. Uh, then Ed Carr uh, gave us a nice presentation on marginal populations and applying the framework there defining what it is, who cares, and uh, then, then talked about how it's hard to apply these for the marginal populations as you go through the scope, assessment, design, implement, evaluate, and adjust areas. Um, he noted that identifying, incorporating, addressing the needs of these marginal populations into the development issues is very challenging, um, and that th this provides some meth methodological guidance for that. And that identification of and attention to these marginal populations is critical to achievements of these uh, climate resilient development goals. And he ended with, ignore this at your own peril. Um, uh, Charlotte Mack, uh, Joel Smith talked about incorporating the framework into the national adaptation plans, talking about the difference between NAPAs, which are uh, look at individual urgent and immediate goals, and the NAPs. Uh, which are meant to look at mid to long-term strategic goals. And their lessons learned out of that is that ownership and buy-in at an early stage of the NAP process is critical and that you need to ground these NAPs, the National Adaptation Plans, in existing uh, planning uh, vehicles. Also, uh, general and regional for these is better than local and specific, and that the uh, NAP is conserved, or maybe the NAPs, that might be a typo, can serve to coordinate the development funders and funders in the country. Alton Byers gave us our first look at some of the local adaptation planning that they did in Nepal and Peru, where they use science and community-driven uh, approaches to climate change adaptation to put together their LAPAs, the local uh, adaptation plan of actions, and the different experiences between Nepal and Peru. Um, but the, the, coming out of that, the lessons learned, you really need to build formal relations with the government before starting on these LAPA process. Um, and that integration of the science into the lap has worked well and increased their credibility. There are some good questions out of this session, but they talked about the, that there's currently a significant disconnect between international finance and private institutions. And there was an example out of the Caribbean where 
uh, business does not work with free money. The decision making there is cutthroat and they're really having to make hard choices between do I build a school or do I invest in long-term climate resilience uh, planning? And that we need to get used to this and be able to make the economic case for making uh, long-term climate investments, show it's profitable in the long-term with a non-zero discount ring. Thank you, Glenn. And that we need to flip the question about uh, from funding climate resilience to only funding climate resilient projects. And then Joanne Potter took us through our first look at the uh, Climate Resilience Infrastructure Services Program. Um, talked about the impact of, of infrastructure, how it's expanding rapidly, it's expensive, it's long lasting. The decision you make now will have very, very long impact, very long, long yeah, impacts. She went through the Chris goals, talked about the pilot cities, and then gave some of the lessons learned out of this. One, that the development first approach um, focuses the scoping and assessment uh, parts. Decision relevant climate information is critical to this. Uh, that these innovative accessible tools will support local government action and that this technical collaboration expands municipal capacity. Um, Jason Vogel then took us through a really nice example of water security in Iwajin in the Philippines. Elo, Elo sorry. Um, and walk through the kind of the surprising experience they had there as they went through the assessment process um, and identifying the and analyzing the set of options that were available to these. And the outcome of this uh, was that implementing the framework is not a linear process in that they found many of the adaptation minute uh, measures were in non-climate aspects of the situation, such as governance, and really you need to be able to integrate uh, solutions on both sides. Glenn Anderson talked to us about the Kazakhstan Climate Resilient Wheat Project, um, how it supports the climate resilient climate uh, vulnerability assessment for the wheat sector in agriculture uh, via this, this stakeholder engagement process, and some nice lessons learned out of that that there's different approaches that need to be tailored for the family farms versus the commercial farms, and that there was different responses to climate information in terms of being able to first understand the information and second, their capacity to act upon that information. And then he also talked about uh, the comparative analysis of stressors and solutions that a lot of the metrics needed for the evaluation uh, weren't available and um, you need to assess your adaptation options versus your development options. Um, and at the governmental level, the assets may not be liquid between these two, but that's less of an issue at the farm level. Michael Cote uh, from Angility took us through the small grants uh, program, going over the, the rationale behind this. They had about 3.3 million over 36 small grants, 11 climber scientists. And there was a real challenge here uh, as they got the first set of uh, applications to this that the quality was low. So they held write shops to really train the participants in grant writing. And they found that this greatly improved the quality and the acceptance rate of the proposals. It improved the, the uh, proposer's capacity to run projects and that several of the institutions have since gone on to get external funding for their projects based on this training. Um, then Jonathan Cook gave an amazing wrap up to that whole uh, whole session where uh, he outlined how the CRDF is the connective tissue for much of the USAID work and went through a number, I think about five different elements in terms of mainstreaming, talking about the flexibility of the framework, the importance of the country level process to find an entry level uh, for the process, how it's good to align with existing planning and financing structures, and getting good donor coordination and partnership can multiply the outcome. He talked about uh, the role in providing information for decision making, uh, bringing weather climate information into decision making, building capacity to assess and apply the information, and then the growing importance of climate services for development. He talked about multi-sector, multi-stakeholder approaches, uh, other items on implementation on and financing. Moving, how, how do you move beyond planning? And that financing is a common concern for stakeholders. And um, how, you want to align behind broad uh, strategic priorities. And there's now an increasing evident, uh, emphasis on readiness. Apparently, this is new. And then future directions want to use this to bridge adaptation and development, 
uh, provide tools for decision making and really use the CRDF as they move forward. And some of the questions out of the session, one was that uh, the common thread is that the CRDF acts as an honest and informed broker for local decision making and that, uh, that it really can empower the locals to run this. Um, and the responses were that it was important to outsource the process to give ownership to the local decision makers and that the USAID forward program is important in this. And uh, uh, let's see, it was noted that the CRISP projects all have local components. Okay, moving into Tuesday morning, uh, Alton Byers talked about the High Map project. I'll, I'll leave the, the in depth on that until we get to the High Mountain session. We had a couple admirals in the room for this, and uh, they ended up asking some very insightful questions at the end. And the second was, uh, uh, was it Joyce uh, Jinga? What's her, what's her first name? Lily, okay, yeah, Lily Jing talked about the marine protected areas and the, the, the experiences they had where the most uh, valuable outcome of their workshops and trainings was building networks in the areas that uh, exchanged challenges and they learned best practices from, the other from each other. And that the other value was that trained managers could train their colleagues in the community on climate change and adaptation approaches. Joanne Par uh, Potter gave us a looking at bur building urban resilience in Asia um, and the focus on the realities of urban processes in the midst of multi multiple stresses. Uh, Peter Schultz talked about the adaptation partnership, uh, the monitoring and evaluation workshops on this and some of the lessons learned out of that that really you need to focus on resilience, the outcomes, the impacts, not just focus on the fact that you're doing work or moving boxes around. Uh, aggregate what is aggregatable, but don't overdo that. You know, lump your, your monetary indicators together, but don't try to cross lump those with say lives or mortality. And that by using existing vulnerability assessments as a baseline and then repeating over time, you do a better job of getting the value. He then also talked about their two climate change adaptation and peace building workshops um, and the various aspects of those, the negatives that climate change can exacerbate conflicts, the conflicts can exasperate climate change and the inner two of these brings even worse outcomes. But on the positive, the flip side was that adaptation can bring peace. Peace building can improve adaptation. Um, but you need to really understand the power dynamics at place. This can either help or hinder your process um, and that there's other development activities that can help. He talked about family planning, reducing water stress and stress on other resources. Uh, Steve Zbiak gave us our first look at the Climate Services Partnership uh, and uh, how they got that up and going, the motivations, the participants and that the finding that there's a major gap in the current knowledge about existing programs, successes, challenges, and practices and outcomes in climate service implementation in developing countries. He went over the results and the priority actions and then, and then uh, discussed some of the lessons learned out of the building, the community uh, climate science partnership community of practice uh, in terms of the ICCS and CSP working groups, the knowledge platform, and the lessons that partnership increases learning and leveraging. And then Alex Guerra Noriega talked about the experiences in Guatemala and assessing vulnerability, increasing climate change resilience in the agricultural sector. Lessons learned out of there is that adaptation knowledge shared, uh, is shared within and between the communities and countries. Demonstration pilots are key, and so we start to first get into this discussion of the value of pilots, and that you really need to keep a focus on local hazards. In the questions section, uh, there are a number of great questions, but let me just hit on one where somebody asks, is, what would you advise if USAID chooses to build off the CCRD moving forward? And uh, it might have been Peter Schultz who gave a fairly long answer to this, that first, participants need to be engaged, have skin in the game, need to have a diversity of participants and avoid the echo chamber, you need to go where the people are, you need to be in situ, you learn things in the field that you just don't learn in the office. Uh, you need to focus on producing outputs that are common use to all the participants. Funding streams need to be identified at the very beginning. The funders need to be there from the very beginning. There needs to be champions whose day jobs are to carry this forward. Um, in climate services, a lot of initiatives. Uh, GFCS has momentum, national level programs. There's sector initiatives like CCAPs. 
and that the CCRD is effective in working with different units of analysis from cities uh, to the mountains to the rural areas. And, and then finally, it was very hard to get other donors to share cost and ownership. Uh, moving into the afternoon, we had a nice session at the uh, Cosmos Club, a really interesting place, uh, talking about lessons learned from the High Mountains Adaptation Partnership. Alton Byers gave a really nice presentation of their Nepal-Peru exchange and collaboration, the different experiences, and the actually very beneficial exchanges that went on between the two. Jonathan Cook talked about the uh, lessons learned from the LAPA process, the local adaptation plans of actions, um, that they are documents and plans, but they're also the process important, uh, and the importance of local adaptation planning, working with recognized practices, uh, the development first approach, and then went over some of the future directions. Uh, we had a nice science presentation from Uliana, I'm not even gonna try her last name, Hordos, Horodsky? Excellent, from CU Boulder, excellent hometown, uh, talking about their super, super glacier lake evolution on the, uh, the glaciers in Nepal, and went into the real details on how they're serving this, surveying the sites, and it sounded like it was not just interesting, but sometimes dangerous work getting out onto these ice cold freezing lakes with small boats, and so um, had a lot of challenges, but a lot of nice information that fed into the process. Uh, we had a video on Cesar's work in Peru. There was a previous video that was just beautiful. Uh, I don't remember who produced that. Um, yeah, talking about the, the, the program there in Nepal and Peru, very insightful. And Cesar, Cesar Portocaro talked about risk reduction uh, in the dangerous glacial lakes as an adaptation process in Peru, going through kind of the triggers there, the situation in, Purdue, in Peru, the risk reduction methodologies to bring down the volumes of the lake, uh, various strategies and mitigation options for that. And the lesson learns that they have to work with climate change, have to work both on risk reductions and integrated uh, water resources management together. Gregory Leonard from uh, University of Arizona talked about the investigation of the Seti River disaster uh, in terms of the field investigation, the outcomes, and the lesson learned that these, the gorges still require monitoring, um, that sometimes you do need to relocate people from the, the low terraces, and that the improved flood early warning systems are needed. Number of questions in that, um, but really what came out of there was the success of this group in calling attention to these glacial lake outburst floods impacts um, and their, their uh, interplay with the agriculture, water, and hydropower sectors and making that a regional initiative. Wednesday was Urban Day, uh, so we started out with uh, Charles Caldwell moderating the, uh, uh, the session, and he said it's not just about climate. There's a number of things out of control for urban, lead, uh, urban leaders. First, accelerating climate stress, but also accelerating stress on services from uncontrolled migration and demographic changes. And so that framed the session. And Joanne Potter talks some more about the CRISP framework, uh, how developing cities face multiple challenges, that reliable infrastructure services are critical to urban development, and then went through some of the pilot city uh, experiences, the approaches, and how they integrated climate into the core processes and talked about an experience in Mozambique. So Maria, Sofia, Dorin, Borowski, did I get that right? Close, sort of. Um, talked about her experience uh, uh, living in, in Papaira, Peru, uh, which is a near coastal, near equator, uh, northern Peru city, about 400,000 that are growing fast, and the infrastructure wasn't prepared for the climate uh, precipitation variability that they were experiencing. Normally, they'd have 800 millimeters of rain per year, but in some cases, they would get 2,000 millimeters in four months. So they'd be very, very bursty and uh, would take out neighborhoods and bridges and how they were designing the infrastructure to respond to this and the role of the CRISP program and with the tool development, the training, the mainstreaming, the peer learning, and then uh, aligning it with the Peruvian national objectives and then looking at the next steps to apply the national guidance to evaluate climate risk and adaptation options and using this as an example to apply and validate the CRISP methodology and tools. So Maria, did I get that? Thanks. Um, 
Monica Bonsai uh, gave a nice, ni another example of the Chris success in the Dominican Republic. This was, this was very compelling for me. Talked about the decentralized nature of the DR, uh, many provinces, uh, revenue distribution efficiencies, uh, 11 different urban transport authorities, almost a, what almost felt like a hopeless situation. High corruption, high socioeconomic disparity. Um, and how they decide to focus down on the, the main urban corridor, on Santo Domingo to Santiago, and uh, brought up this, the idea of the small pilot projects. Are they, are they good or not? And uh, they're often seen as a waste, but if you tie them to larger projects, they actually can be catalytic, and that building the relationships, even if it's just in pilots, is critical and lays the ground for the larger efforts. And so that was the start of that discussion. Outcomes, uh, they talked how the CRIS recommendations are being incorporated into the water utility planning, a broader mission, uh, design changes implemented because of the effectiveness of this pilot, uh, the importance of having local decision makers in the discussion, and now they're looking at different sectors, uh, electrical, utilities, telecom, et cetera. And the utility, based on their interaction through the CRIS framework, is now in a position to actually seek uh, additional funding for implementation. Sierra uh, Bainbridge from the Mass Design Group talked about building resilience. And again, really uh, about the importance of engaging community in both design and construction. Uh, how the Western models are really not appropriate. There's a brain drain in these countries. She was talking about Rwanda. You end up with large wards of underserved people. And from a design aspect, a focus on using local materials and labor so that you don't have to import these from far away after a disaster. The, the uh, local construction people know how to work with the materials, but also on design, focusing on a beautiful location, a beautiful design that's well cared for. And this encourages the patients to come in before it's too late rather than try to avoid uh, the hospitals there. And talked about a number of lef lessons learned in that, but this, those were really my takeaways. Uh, the, the number of questions, but somebody asked, is the science driving the selection of these case studies? Uh, yes, these seem to be intermittent weather, but how were these really uh, selected? And they went through the, the criteria selection, They're looking for mid-sized, rapidly growing cities with low capacity to respond. There had to be some USAID mission interest in the area. The city had to have the interest and capacity to be a pilot, but really tried to avoid setting up separate institutions and focused on uh, tools to integrate climate into the uh, existing structures. And so we're seeing that theme come up again and again. Uh, more on Urban Day, Joanne Potter uh, talked about the CRISP program. Again, I've talked about that before. I think I'll jump over that. Andrea Martin from Cascadia talked about deploying the climate impacts decision support tools in Vietnam. Their uh, SIMPAC DST, uh, Excel-based tool, so it says it takes about 15 minutes to go through. We should actually see that. Uh, but this was a really nice presentation. Well, talked about the process of starting with a pilot, pilot city of Hue and then scaling up to the national level where it's now working at 60 provinces. Cascadia is handing off to the uh, VIUP. Uh, what's that acronym? Yeah, okay. Um, it's engaged several provinces, uh, understood the wider needs, and based on their feedback, uh, updated to the tool, held national workshops, and now getting into a larger national conversation on community resilience. Uh, Dr. Kong went through the, the use of this tool in Vietnam, the use management, the future outlook, um, showed how they used it in Hue uh, with the urban planning, suggestions on how to address sea level rise, and that the, the plan completely changed in response to the use of this tool. They established coastal buffer zones. The tourism facility was moved inland, making it more resilient. Um, lessons learned out of that, looking to the future, there's a need for continued integration of available provincial uh, climate adaptation plans and local data. But uh, Dr. Kwong also talked about the constraints, time and resource constraints, that the national administrators have limited time and resources to identify in, and input new information. So maybe this is something that needs to be thought about as you're looking at the MNO of these systems. There's also limitations in terms of expertise and capacity, uh, identification and synthesis of the climate information that can be challenging for urban uh, planners who really need to update the tool. Uh, Amar, Amar Malik from the Urban Institute talked about um, 
the urban service delivery assessment framework. Again, I found this talk very compelling as well, while well, they were all compelling, but uh, really went into why do you measure urban service delivery and the challenges as, as rainfall patterns change, the service systems are being stressed or even becoming inoperable, uh, causing a great deal of distress within the cities. Uh, access to services directly impacts the human condition, fosters productivity and economic growth. Um, and that if you can systematically review structures of urban service delivery systems, you can evaluate outcomes, ID, uh, identify gaps, and improve performance. And so they went through a number of, of ways that they were doing that. Uh, I thought that was, found it very interesting. Again, the questions were, were quite, uh, quite interesting for that session. And, and um, Vietnam, uh, some of the questions were, uh, as the plans evolve to the tool, how did this occur and how did the people of Vietnam learn from the tool? And uh, some of the discussion revolved around the fact that urban planners are very use uh, visual that bullet lists of recommendation aren't nearly as compelling as spatial information and that the national version of the tool uh, integrated and linked to graphics much more than the, the first round of that did. Um, and did the tools take into account how other sectors would react to climate change? Um, and Dr. Juan noted uh, very wisely that urban planners typically don't think of one sector. So they're ideal partners for this. They're looking across many different sectors and it was also noted that the private investment dwarfs the public investment. The private uh, sector needs to understand that it's in their interest to be climate resilient. And so this is the second or third time that topic's come up. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, uh, we had the uh, wonderful Macedonian uh, presentation, Alexander, Vladimir, Igor. Uh, we had magic, we had jokes, we had, it was, it was Great, uh, talking about mainstreaming climate change into the green agenda process in, in Macedonia. Uh, went through the vision of strengthening environmental movement in Macedonia, the goals to uh, increase capacity to adapt to climate change, but also to use climate change as a platform to improve the local democratic process. Uh, some talk on the green agenda, and then some critical success uh, factors that there has to be clear ownership, local ownership of the results, that should tangible results plus trust, plus cooperation, plus involvement, plus commitment, plus proactivity, plus leadership, and you have uh, great outcomes, but it may be difficult to get all of that. They seem to be capable of though. Again, pilot projects came up and uh, they viewed those as very important uh, and they had some nice play on words. Now, many strategies uh, are out there, but they need to become strategies, otherwise it becomes a tragedy. So. Um, um, also that it's important to learn from failures. So uh, well done. Uh, some questions. Um, does your approach to build resilience apply to other shocks beyond that? And it was sound that that with a small capacity, the capacity in the smaller communities limited, this really helps to multiply this. Um, what's the interaction with the disaster management community? Well, it sounds like it needs to be improved and that uh, stake stakeholder mapping is critical to success. And then later that afternoon, we had the demonstration of the new USAID tool for assisting, assessing institutional capacity to address climate change. Uh, that was an interesting experience and kind of made me want to go back and look at our strategic plan. All right, so uh, we come to today, uh, Jim Beiser's already talked about this, but I'll go through kind of my take on this and, and list, the, list the takeaways I had that we started off with Walter Bathgen's keynote, uh, the definition of the production, translation, transfer, and use for decision making uh, of climate services. He had his beautiful CAT scan example going from research to the processing to the applied research, private sector, operator, doctor, to patient, and really have to have the right point of engagement to be effective. Uh, what does this mean in the real world? And the need to adopt a new paradigm of, of you know, going from the Noah's Ark example of having perfect information to the uh, the nuclear Jinko Bilboa in Hiroshima on how highly resilient systems can uh, survive large shocks. And the conclusion that the production phase requires research, that translation, transfer, and the use requires consideration of the, uh, the information networks, the spaghetti diagram, and we really need a new approach on climate adaptation. Steve Zbiak gave us a, a run through again on the Climate Service Partnership, uh, the accomplishments, the investments, and then looking ahead 
on how we continue the work linked to the global framework and other international programs. That was a really nice program you built there, Steve. Uh, Glenn Roy Brown talked about uh, climate smart products for agriculture in Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica, the most beautiful Caribbean island country, I believe I remember. Um, went through a number of the, the examples that the early warning systems on droughts were needed, uh, specific real time farm level weather forecasts and how they address those needs and the successes that you can build awareness of available weather products, conduct assessments of the usefulness of the, the, their monthly farmers bulletin, further develop drought and precipitation monitoring forecast tools, and that the Jamaican Met Service, I'm, I'm looking, there he is, uh, will continue to champion and advance this work, so we're counting on you. Uh, Lisa Goddard gave a, a really nice detailed presentation of the IRAP, Integrated Climate Information Decision Processes for Regional Climate Resilience. Uh, sounds like a very, very nice project. Um, where the strength here, uh, she found, is really at the intersection of all the partners. They really uh, went through the five pillars of identi identifying vulnerabilities, opportunities, with the stakeholders to understand, quantify, reduce uncertainties, ID interventions or technologies to reduce vulnerability, uh, identify policies and institutional arrangements that reduce vulnerability or transfer the risks. That's an important one. And then uh, the fifth one of design evaluation to the very outset for targeted inventions and engagements. And so that's another topic that we've seen coming up again and again. The evaluation needs to be built in from the very beginning. And then Jen, Jenny Frankel Reed ran us through Severe, a project that, that I'm really fond of. Um, and how it works with the regional institutions to get information in the hands of decision makers to improve climate resilient, low emissions development outcomes. I uh, talked about who was involved, the severe results framework, and the results of all of their tailored decision support tools, all the many university fellows, small grants, two million map requests, a lot of stuff coming out of this. Uh, and then highlighted two projects, flood forecasting in Bangladesh on how they were apply, able to apply the NASA satellite assets to fill a huge information gap where the Bangladesh were not getting the upstream water information but being subjected to floods and how they um, were able to expand or, or increase the warning time from two, two days to eight days. Um, and the deaths out of these were, were uh, decreased by two order magnitudes from the thousands down to the tens. Um, and then another one on for, frost forecasting. And so there were a number of nice lessons learned out of this. Um, but the, the bottom line that the field is wide open for expanded tech, technology co uh, cooperations with Severe, there's still much to learn. Um, the uh, questions uh, out of this, uh, what are the lessons learned that you have with unsuccessful tools? And again, the, we're starting to see this one come up of what, what are you learning from failure or even looking for it? And uh, Lisa noted, it's important to evaluate what didn't work and the options for doing it right. At what point do you just put down the tool and move on? Or what, at what point do you adapt it? And that the pilots help avoid this. Uh, in the second session in the morning, Ed Carr walked through the uh, evaluation of climate services. I talked how traditionally climate services focused on climate information uh, governed by assumptions that is actually useful and of utility to, to the users. There's little focus on communication or understanding the users and how that needs to change. Talked about the challenges uh, going through this process and then the evaluation process within the CCRD, uh, the need for learning and, and the outcomes. And then Sheila Navala, Oh, sorry, uh, Navalia? So, uh, Onzeri, sorry, also from University of Carolina, talked about uh, implementing this evaluation and assessing Mali's Hydromet Advisory Program, went through the background, the assessment, and then a number of lessons learned that it's critical to build evaluation in from the very beginning. We've heard that before in order to accurately assess outcomes and value. Uh, you might be providing great value, but unless you've done the evaluation right, you may not be able to demonstrate that. Um, so another key lesson was to evaluate and adjust uh, effective uh, climate service evaluation. It has to go beyond just surveys uh, to embrace a wider range of methods and that this post hoc climate service evaluation is consute, very time consuming, costly, and still could have indeterminate results. Uh, Kathy Vaughn took us through the uh, CSP uh, Global Framework Case Studies Project, 
uh, talked about the need at the large scale evaluations, then the mid scale of eva mid level evaluations, and how they reviewed and adjusted the activity and the lessons learned that, that you need to focus on the type of learning, the single, double, triple loop learning. You need to ask the right question who wants to know what? Uh, improve the monitoring evaluation and focus on quality assurance and then use evaluations to better understand the value judgments in terms of what are we valuing, equity, expertise, sustainability, et cetera. And then Glenn Anderson, chief of party, um, went through the economic valuation of climate services. I almost ran three pages of notes on this one, but really quickly went through the background, talked about the whole system, ex ante, post ante analysis, the value chain, stages in implementing a socioeconomics benefit study, steps in designing a, a cost benefits uh, study, benefit cost study, uh, the trainings that they held, and the next step, that there was really a need to better understand decision making and behavior. It's the bottom line here. Gave an example out of Kazakhstan, about different wheat trials and having better information is only part of the solution. People are going to still make a strategic behavior. Walter talked about this as you may apply the, supply the perfect climate service information and the, the people may still choose to act differently. Um, kind of the question that stood out for me is that it's hard to assess climate service effectiveness. You need a situation where something happens that you forecast that was acted upon where there's an outcome and a number of nice responses of, you know, what are we evaluating here? The climate service itself or the use of that climate services? And uh, Kathy noted, we need to creatively look at both. Uh, one of the lessons learned that success often depends on having the right person at the right place at the right time. And, and that is so critical, the, the proper personalities, but also the need to get beyond that and institutions where you'll have success whether or not you just happen to have the right people on both sides of the exchange. And we talked about a success with the World Food Program, NDVI, forage information with a tangible $6 million benefit. Um, the bottom line is that better and more effective information allows better planning and decision making. And then finally, uh, Jim Beiser walked us through a number of, of illuminating uh, examples of, of um, resource uh, restrictions and uh, how coincident patterns can lead to disasters. So I'll leave, it, I'll leave it with that. And I guess we have some, hopefully some time for discussion at this point. Yeah, or we just open it up for discussion. All right, so I've successfully stunned you all into a post-lunch silence. Uh, it worked. I'll give you my notes. So no, I mean, but I was standing on the shoulders of giants here. This was a series of very, very. Uh, actually inspiring presentations through this whole section and I look forward to the discussion on how we move forward from here. So. so maybe I'll ask a question. Do you need a mic? I mean, do you, maybe I'll just ask to oh, I'm not sure if I should direct the question to you, Lawrence, or to Glenn, or maybe you can kind of hand off the question to each other. <laughs> um, but just zooming way out as you did, do you feel as though the CRD framework was cohesive across all of these program areas? Yeah, well, um, I, I got the sense that it was developed and applied, but we would see a more cohesive application if it went through another round. So um, this is this this it's a five year project, but it is a new five year project. I think that it takes time to actually figure out the the, the strong points, the weak points, and where you need to adjust. Uh, Ed, um, along those lines, I I would actually say that part of the trick was that the CRD framework actually came into sort of existence in final form about midway through, 
CCRD. So an awful lot of the work that a lot of people in this room were doing was already running before that happened. And I think that actually it probably speaks to the strength of the framework that when Sheila and I were putting together presentations, we found it actually fairly easy to take lessons from what we'd been doing and actually talk about how it informed parts of the framework. So I actually think it speaks to the fact that it does, at least for the stuff we were working on, it does work pretty well. Hi, I'm Joanna Pratt from Stratus Apt. Um, this is an unfair question because it relates to what I'm going to be doing next on this project. But I wondered if you had, I think you mentioned two or three or four big picture takeaways from everything you heard this week. But I wondered if you could maybe briefly uh, state what you think kind of the cohesive findings or results or next steps, big picture conclusions would be. All right. So. Um, and feel free, anybody, to fill in on if I miss miss these, because really this is um, I, I'm not part of the project. I'm, I'm viewing it as an outsider. Um, I think one, this is a big step forward in providing a systematic framework for um, implementing a lot of these type of projects, and that it's useful at a number of different levels within USAID for other researchers trying to implement uh, exactly what this was designed, and then for the countries themselves. And so that was something I was really impressed with, how this seemed applicable across different scales of application and decision making. Uh, it's clear, I'm not sure this is a unique outcome to this, but it seemed to be a consistent theme along here, is that there are values to pilot projects in terms of making sure you're not going down uh, too far down a wrong road or actually being able to quickly get some early wins and demonstrate success, build the communication links among potential partners from which larger projects uh, could evolve. I think one of the big themes I saw that coming out of this was that you need to have the local engagement. You're almost wasting your time if you try to do this from your desk in Washington, D.C. You need to be in the field. You actually have to have the motivation coming out of the actual decision makers, the smallholder farmers, the utilities. Um, Glenn, you got more on that? Um, I, I just wanted to sort of answer Mike's question a little bit, and maybe John or Jonathan. Be, several years ago, uh, Heather McRae uh, talked about adaptation as a continuous process of learning, and that one of the real benefits is the learning that you do over time. And, and this is an incremental capacity building, understanding the information, learning how to use it. Um, but it also is, is when, if you go through and you think about monitoring and evaluation and adaptive management, it's what do you learn from all of those things? And I think, I think the, the way we've approached the adaptation planning and the climate resilient development has always been a process of learning. We started, as John mentioned, focusing on projects. Um, because that was where we thought some of the demand was at that point. But ultimately, as John mentioned, he got really started thinking about development first uh, in Madagascar, and then when we went to St. Lucia and Barbados as well. I think there's a lot still to be learned. Um, I think that we've kept the framework very general and flexible because there's no two planning processes are ever going to be the same in terms of data, capacity, time frames, resources, or the kinds of questions that have to be answered. Sometimes you're just going to be trying to do an education program, an awareness program. And I think that going forward, there's still a lot to be learned. And I, you know, I hope that this work will continue. Um, but it really is evolutionary. It really is a process of continuing to learn, assess what you learn, and move on and, and try to adapt. Peter Schultz, ICF. Um, in terms of the next steps, I, let me back up. Where I think this project uh, made the biggest difference was 
on the, the scope stage. And I think really emphasizing that to work within a development agency, you have to have this development first approach. And that starts with the scoping. Um, the community as a whole uh, has previously has done so much work on the assess stage. Um, and so I, we did make some contributions there, but I, I really think it's on, on the first step. And then also on the third step, on the design, and really thinking intelligently about how to pull together what you've learned in the first two steps to develop uh, approaches that can address the risks that climate variability and change present. And we also began to, began to make inroads on implement and maybe less so on the evaluate and va validate uh, step. And I think it's on those, it's on the fourth and fifth, on the, the implementation and on the evaluation where we have the biggest progress to make. And I think it's, it's really essential uh, in order to take this kind of to, to the main streets across the world. Um, to, and it's really about scaling this. So we've, we've developed this framework, we've piloted it, but the, the challenges are really bringing this to scale. Um, and right now it's, you know, this kind of activity is subsidized. So aid is subsidizing it, other development agencies are subsidizing it, MDBs are subsidizing this. We need to bring it to scale and to develop that economic rationale so that it's owned locally and it's carried forward locally. So to do that, I think one of the key linchpins is developing the economic case, developing the business case, that this improves your top line, it improves your bottom line, it reduces your risk, uh, it, it helps you deal with the regulatory concerns uh, that are out there. So what are the drivers? And it really kind of gets to those immediate drivers. And I think we, we have more work, particularly on the economic side, to, to build the case that we're we're uh, meeting the needs and meeting the, those drivers. Um, I guess one other thing is that to get to that point, we need to get more efficient at doing what we're doing, okay? I mean, we've, we, we have really benefited from what aid has contributed into this, but we need to think about how to do it better and quicker. And that's, that's linked to the getting to scale uh, point as well. Yeah, I think that's a real sign of a, a kind of a maturing uh, state of this, this uh, this this whole approach, uh, I think we we saw that at ICCS one in New York. When uh, just can't thank Glenn enough for jumping on the economic valuation piece because without that, it was going to be impossible to convince uh, governments to invest in uh, advancing climate services, uh, building that into their their uh, development plans. And so, it, it, within the climate service lens, that 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 became very apparent that there was a big gap there. Jenny? Okay, Jenny gets the last question. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, Jenny Frankel, Reed USAID. I, just similar to what Peter was saying, my observation has been that initially in climate adaptation, we tried to differentiate. We tried to say, this is different. We need to dedicate specific attention to this, and it's different in these ways. And we separated it out from what everybody was doing, kind of the business as usual. But we've learned from that, and I think now we're saying, this is a part of what you're doing. And we've come away from differentiating um, back to integrating or connecting that. Um, and so I think the framework represents that evolution in that we're trying to democratize the issue and say that you as a development expert in whatever sector you're in know a lot about variability in the sector. Here's some additional information that you can, you know, some more questions, some more methods that can help you deal with climate change too. So I think that's something that, at least as USAID, we hope this doesn't stay as a, you know, a specialized sort of issue, but really one that a lot of development experts from a lot of sectors can, can take up. All right, that was, a, that was a nice wrap up to that. So thanks, Jenny. Okay. So we have about a 10 or so minute break. Um, go help us.